their fist. They have backed the bay up to the lift bags. They are attaching everything. Uh, the, in the center, in the red vest, is Pierre Valdi of Vifermer. Pierre is the oceanographic engineer, I guess, from Vifermer who designed the system to bring up the big piece. It was his plan. You see the lift bags there containing their diesel fuel. You see the Zodiac out uh, away a little bit when they start bringing the big piece up. Um, this is what's going to happen. As they begin to winch and raise the big piece up, one of the first comments someone made was, look at those portholes. This is the first time since April 14th, 1912, that sunlight has shown through them. And of course, everybody around just got very quiet at that thought. April 14th to August 10th, 1912 to 1998. So this piece begins to come up. Um, they've taken a wonderful um, care with making sure that this big piece doesn't sway. They've got it locked down on the sides. They've hooked some um, ropes, some support ropes to keep it st stabilized. You can see on the front of the picture that they have a wooden frame that they've laid ropes on. The ropes will serve as padding so that it's not uh, going to damage the metal in any way. As the piece comes up, you'll see that lower extension. That lower extension is the little piece. Just to give you a scale, look to the left and you'll see George Tullock standing over at the base of the winch. And you'll see how tall he is compared to the rest of the size. Um, it's about three times his height, so it's about 20 feet from top to bottom there. Possibly 21 feet is what we've estimated. They brought it in and they laid it down on the wood very carefully like this. Um, you can see the supporting beams from the interior. We're looking at the inside, not the external side of the big piece. Such a contrast on the back. The picture on the right shows one of the porthole casings. The porthole is made of brass. The brass was practically brand new um, when we brought it up. All it needed was a little bit of polish, a little bit of shining, and it would look as if it was just put on the ship. The discoloration is due to being next to the iron for so long it would polish out. But if you look to the left, you'll see a bright yellow color that is from some of the oxides and some of the bacteria that have started the oxidation process and started the rustical process. The picture on the left, you can see the rustical formation on the lower part of the right side beam. Looks like little coral almost going up the right hand side. Those are rusticles. That's technically what those are. Uh, you'll see brilliant yellows, mustard yellows, light browns, dark browns, very dark umber type tones all throughout it. Uh, Close-ups showing the same thing. The picture on the right shows the contrast between the porthole and the metal surrounding the porthole. Um, one of my students saw this one time and said, Coach, that looks like a pepperoni pizza. And I said, well, it does, doesn't it? It does look sort of like one but that is the rust and the rustical formation on the iron of the external side. Uh, inter this is the internal side of the ship. Olivier Berger is spraying water on the metal. Anything that's been on the ocean for that long, the salt particles have become embedded into the crystalline lattice of the iron, okay? It just happens, the salt particles get intermingled. The salt will make the iron very brittle. So what Olivier is doing and what they had to do the entire trip and even into conservation is they had to make sure the, the, the big piece was kept moist. They would eventually put this in a desalinator. They would put in uh, distilled water and the distilled water would wash and wash and wash and eventually remove those salt crystals. Uh, once they were convinced that the salt crystals had been removed, then, the, um, then and only then were they able to dry out and let the, the big piece dry, and it took some months to do that. So spraying the water on it was important. 
this is what it looks like at the Luxor. This is what you saw, Shelly. Um, it's got different things around it as well. But if you look to the left of the big piece, you'll see a sign and you'll see a person in a shadow to give you comparison of how large this piece really is. Um, this is about 12 feet, maybe 11 feet from the bottom rivets to the top. It's very heavy, so it's in a large um, framework. RMST used to take this to different traveling exhibits. It ended up being very complicated because you're moving something that weighs 12 tons to 15 tons, uh, 14 tons, something like that. And to set it up and to take it down was a tremendous labor. You'd have to get a huge crane in to lift it. You'd have to get a building that could have it moved into the building and then put it in the place you wanted to exhibit it. So it was decided, let's make it static. Let's keep it in one place for a long time. And hopefully that'll ease the wear and tear on it being moved so much. Another thing that we recovered when we were down there, Walter Lord's book talks about Charles Lightoller sending down crewmen uh, to open the D-deck door so that people could board the lifeboats from the interior of the ship. This door stood open. It was open when the wreck was discovered. So it is believed that Ballard's two crewmen that he sent down did indeed accomplish their mission of opening that lower D-deck door. However, no one has um, told of any lifeboat going back to that door to take in any passengers. Uh, so the door stood open. While we were there in 98, this door happened to break off. It's on video. Nautil was um, uh, looking at it, and all of a sudden the door hinges and then fractures and then falls. So they were able to recover the D-deck door. The interior, you can see the worm gears that, uh, that help lock the door in place, but you can see the tremendous amount of interior rust that is gathered on the inside of that door. And you can definitely see a lot of feet and legs to show you the scale of how big that door really is. Where so is the door, observation. Bill? I'm sorry, go ahead. Where is the door? The D-deck door right now, I, th I thought was at the Luxor. If it is not, it may be in Orlando. Um, I have not seen it um, on tour in a while, so I'm not sure exactly where it is. I know it went to a traveling exhibit that they sent to China about three years ago. It did come back. There is a third exhibit, I think, in Idaho right now, and it may be in one of those three exhibits, either in uh, Las Vegas, Idaho, or down in Orlando. That's a good question to find out where that is. What they've done, you'll see painter's tape in blue that they've surrounded the windows with. And this is why they're using the cleaners to clean out the door. They didn't want to damage those um, sealers, sealers that they have for the windows. So that's what it looks like after it's been conserved. And you can see that there's pretty significant damage to the iron. Um, it has been estimated that the ship loses anywhere from 100 to 200 pounds of iron per day due to the iron eating bacteria. And it's just taking its toll. And there's nothing that can stop that. There's nothing that pre can prevent that. So this is what the D-Deck door looks like. You can see the RMST copyright on this picture. One of the ROVs that was used on the um, 98 trip was the Magellan 725. The Magellan unit was used a couple of times when airplanes have crashed into the oceans. And the Magellan device is strong enough to where it can go down it can help retrieve the black box. And that's one of the, the things that it has done several times. To the left of this picture, you'll see a couple of large cylinders. Um, those cylinders house high definition cameras. High definition was in its infancy in 1998. Um, so those high def cameras were, well, 20 years ago technology, it's now, so far outdated, but it was state of the art at that time. They wanted to get some of the best pictures that they could. 
and now our cell phones can take better pictures than those cameras could. But those cameras are designed to operate at the bottom of the ocean. So, but it was very special at the time. Um, this is a picture of the Magellan launch from Ocean Voyager. You see the crane and you see at the far right Ocean Voyager on it. Uh, excuse me, the Magellan on the end of the Ocean Voyager crane. Um, it would pick up, it would move it over toward the ocean, it would lower, they would test the systems, and then when all the systems were go, then it would take two and a half hours to drop to the bottom. The little rectangular black thing between the ship and the Magellan is called the depressor unit. The depressor is like an electronic housing apparatus. It's a large framework that has different electronic things in it and they put it on the depressor unit rather than on the ROV to give the ROV manipulative capacities. Plus the ROV, the uh, depressor acts as a buffer. So the ROV can do this while this is hooked to the ship. So if the ship is bobbing up and down, you may get this part and it will not affect the use of the Magellan as it goes out that way. Here's the launch of the T-Rex. This is our camera system, our ROV. It's down in the lower basket. Uh, it was designed to be very small, to fit down the hallways that that larger Robin system um, would not go down. So this is the launch of the T-Rex. Um, big, big milestone for our family as we made it into the ocean and we made it down. Our first dive was 27 hours. In the second half of the expedition, this is the power team standing around discussing plans for the next day. In the far left reading a book is author Jack Eaton. Jack is no longer with us. But Jack Eaton um, was a walking entertainment center. Um, he had the best one-liners of any human I've ever known. Um, he, was, he and Robin Williams could go head to head with, with one-liners. Uh, drinking coffee in the foreground is Dick Silloway. Um, you see David Alisco, and then you see me down there with my glasses right next to Charles Haas. Standing on the right-hand side is uh, Gary Hines, one of the producers. In the foreground on the right with his hand like this is Angus Best, who was a metallurgist specialist. Angus was uh, very happy to contribute to the book. Great guy, Angus was, enjoyed meeting him. What we had was we had four different vessels and at any time we had three cameras operating at the same time. We had Nautil, we had the Magellan, and we had the Robin camera system on Nautil. And if you look, you'll see a variety of monitors going around and all of us are looking at different things. The blue shirt on the left-hand side with the number nine on it is me. Uh, beside me is Dick Silloway. There are two metallurgists. Angus Best is in the blue. Jack Eaton is in the back. Um, I think that's Stephanie Ratcliffe in front of Jack. We're all taking notes and writing down what we see, what the times and the dates are, what the, the video stamp is so that when we go to do reports and things like that, we have all of our, our data and our information. And uh, this, at this area here, they showed 400 hours of video during the entire expedition. Um, Gunter Bobler took this picture of me on the wing bridge hanging over the side of the ship. I'm sorry, I should have taken that one out. We'd wake up every morning Shelly, you'll love this. And these little birds were all over the deck. They would see the light, they would fly, and they would land and hit the ship. But they needed more room to take off than they had, so they couldn't take off. These birds are called petrels, P-E-T-R-E-L. They're as cute as can be. You pick them up in your hand, and you can pet them, and they'll just, they didn't purr, but they made a cute little sound, almost like a coo. And they had webbed feet because they have to swim, but they had their little hooked beaks to enable them to, to eat the fish that they would capture. So what we would do every morning is I would get up and several others would come out on deck and we'd find the petrels and we'd always talk to, to them and we'd take them up to the upper deck. 
and we'd give them flight by tossing them. And they had enough room to where they were able to get lift and they would fly off. And every morning we, you know, 30 to 40 of these would be on our deck. It was a precious moment. It really was. The fun of being on the expedition is riding in the Zodiac. This little floating boat with, it's like four wheeling in a Jeep. And you can see how everybody's riding in them. And George Tulloch is in the front. PH is to the far right. And they are on their way over to the base supporter that day. Um, riding it when it was choppy was the best because you'd get the airborne and you'd, you know, it was that great, great fun. Here you see the four ships. The one where the picture is being taken is uh, the fourth ship, and you get to see the other three all on site. And you see the zodiacs going back and forth. The zodiacs are our taxi service. Climbing onto the petrol was horrible. It was an experience. Um, what you would have to do is the side of the ship and the water was doing this. Now, if you disembark your Zodiac when the ship, when, this, when it's at its highest point, the water is still moving and you can climb up. But if you disembark when it's at a low point, then the water and the Zodiac itself will hit you on the way up and it hurts. It's a heavy, heavy ship. So you had to time your, your removal from the Zodiac so that you could step out at its highest point and then you had to keep climbing upwards and you technically climbed up a rope ladder and then they helped you over the railing onto that ship. Um, great, great experience. It really was. You know, that's reminiscent uh, climbing, having to in a moderate sea, climb up a rope ladder into a ship definitely brings my mind back to what it would have been like if you were frozen from being in 27 degree weather on the, in a rowboat basically in the North Atlantic, and then having to grip that rope ladder and climb up out of, you know, the lifeboat and uh, into the Carpathia. I, I can only imagine the horrors of having to do that. You're right. Climbing up a rope ladder, just like you saw. And um, you had women that had never done anything like that. They had not climbed ladders. And so a lot of the crewmen were very good to help them get up the ladder. And I hope they, you know, come up behind them to help them if they needed to. But that took great courage and, um, overcoming great fear, I'm sure, for many of the ladies. Absolutely. I can't imagine some of those first-class ladies ever doing anything like that. I bet they but couldn't you, either. Oh, I had never thought about that before. That is a wonderful point. Here's our expedition team. Um, this is the second half. The NBC crew had already disembarked. Um, I am behind Jack Eaton. You'll see in the center of the picture, the man with a hat is Dick Silloway. To our left of Dick is Charles Haas, right at the point of the um, star. Two people to Dick's right is Jack Eaton, and then you'll see the dark sunglasses. I always used to wear the photo grays that would get dark. And uh, this is the crew. Uh, a particular note, if you look at the front row in the red jacket is George Tullock's wife, Cindy. And beside her to our right is George. And behind George is P.H. Narjale. George Tullock and P.H. Narjale have done so much for the, they have to share the responsibility of the majority of the artifacts that have been raised and that are on display continually. To the right, our right of P.H. is a man in a white t-shirt. That is Tom Detweiler. Tom was on duty on the Ballard expedition when Titanic was found. You can watch the Nat Geo special when they find Titanic and Tom is on duty at one of the stations when they, they see the boiler and start looking at the debris. So Tom was a part of ours. Tom is a wonderful person to talk to. 
he is just such an outstanding expert in his field. And he's last I heard he was working with Odyssey Marine and they found the huge Spanish shipwreck that had about $600 million worth of gold and silver called the Black Swan is what they called it. And uh, the governments and the Admiralty courts got involved over who owned that shipwreck. So that's Tom Detweiler. Oops. So that was our expedition. We did so many things. We did fantastic uh, research. Dr. Roy Cullimore, for example, um, left tests in 96 and 98. They were called BART tests and it dealt with the biological decay, how fast it would take the iron to decay. And he had several different pieces of iron. He had straight pieces of iron. He had twisted pieces of iron and he had several carriers and they would put those at different places at the wreck site to see at what rates were, was decay happening. Um, when they go back and they've gone back, they've always had one of the representatives of Dr. Cullimore's group go out and photograph and measure what the decay is after so many years. Uh, it's been 22 years, uh, 24 years now since the 98 expedition. So they're able to see that growth over 24 years of those items, that he, the BART tests that he deployed in 1998. So those were some of the things we did in 98. Uh, what it didn't talk about and I didn't show pictures of was the hurricane. Um, we knew that there was a hurricane, it was Hurricane Bonnie striking the coast of North Carolina. And then it turned and went out into the ocean and our ship's captain and the, the officers were keeping a very significant watch over the tracking this storm. And it was about five o'clock in the afternoon and they said, it's gonna go about 400 miles south of us. We'll get some choppy waves, but nothing bad. So we all went to bed and we woke up the next morning and the crew was hustling. They were moving around quickly. They were tying things down. They were securing different things that were on the outside parts of the ship. They were tying ropes onto either side of the doorways. If you had to go out of one side and into another, you had ropes on both sides of you. And they announced that the storm had taken a turn in the middle of the night and it was heading right toward us. And we were gonna be right in the middle of it and we were vacating the site as quickly as possible. They had to call up Nautil they had to call up Magellan. They had to lock those down. And then as they started going, one of our engines failed. So we have one engine. We have a huge tropical four to tropical five hurricane coming at us. And we have a lot of landlubbers that did not know how to experience this on a ship on the ocean. Uh, they were not able to cook for us during this storm. They were able to put like um, packs of crackers and they had little small snack things that they were able to, to bring up and said, if you need something, grab this, but we can't, you know, the pots won't stay on the stove, we can't cook. They told us not to go far from our Gumby suits just in case they didn't expect trouble, but do not go far from your, zombie, your Gumby suits. And so people would go down the hall carrying their Gumby suits. Uh, the swells started up about 6 to 6.30 a.m. They were mild swells and they kept getting greater and greater and greater. And before you know it, they're six to eight foot swells and they're 12 foot swells. And then they gave orders to secure. It means don't go outside. You shouldn't go outside um, for any reason. Um, so we were either in the galley or we were in our cabins and our ships would go up at an angle of about 60 degrees. And we'd get to the top of an 80 foot peak and we'd stay there for a moment or two and then we'd come down at a 60 degree slant. And it was like we were sliding downhill. We were speeding up as we went down and we'd hit the bottom with a rough hit and then we'd start up the next wave. And we did that for 17 hours. Oh Eight gosh. Foot waves. Um, wow. If we laid in our bunks, um, if our feet were facing the front of the ship, as we went up the hill, our heads would bash. 
And then as we went down, our feet would bash and everything in the room was sliding with it. Oh. Um, people getting nauseous, they got seasick well before we got to that stage. Um, I have personal video from that and the ship that is about 150 yards away from us, you'll see it. And the next thing you see is this huge wall of water. And then here's the ship again. And then here's a huge wall of water. And then here's the ship again. And it's in a pouring rainstorm. And we found out that, let me preface this, when your ship goes into a wave, you have to go into it this way so that it goes up. If not, you get the side adventure and you flip over. Right. Okay. It hits the side and sideways and it would flip. So we have to stay nose into the wave to ride it. Our second engine went out one time while we were in the middle of the, oh, the hurricane. My gosh. They did not tell us. And we were very fortunate. It, the ship did drift and go back down. Um, but they were able to get the other engine working again very quickly. And um, so we were able to maneuver back into the wave. And of course, they didn't tell us that till after it was over with. Uh, we had a doctor that was on board with us. He was a medical doctor. He now works in California. He contributed to the book. That was the greatest time in his life, he said. This, he went up on the top of the deck one time and he puts an eye patch over and he stands in a great pose and he holds out a pirate sword. <laughs> and so we take this picture of Dr. Budman um, he just called him the doc and he, he didn't yell, I'm the king of the world, but he just stood there in that pose for a little while. And it was a great picture. It was a great, great moment. He was just living life to the fullest. The doctor did have to prescribe some uh, relaxers to a few people because uh, they bet. were so violently stressed. And, um, fortunately we had no injuries. We had bumps and bruises for people trying to walk and then boom, you start going uphill, so you fall into a wall. I will share a funny story. I've, I've, I've shared this, is we had a large restroom. It had three or four stalls, and it had three or four shower stalls, but they were unisex. You know, anybody went in, just closed the, the shower stall. What the women would do, and I'm very thankful they did this, is Two or three of them would go at a time and one would stand guard while the other two went in. Then they'd rotate so that they could have some privacy. And, uh, you know, guys just went on in. They just did everything. Several of the guys had gone in to go to the bathroom and when they came out, their pants were soaking wet. Oh. And the reason why is it's tough to do what you need to do when one arm is holding one wall and the second arm is holding the other wall and you can't control certain things. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, I just made this a PG level podcast. Thank you for um, that. <laughs> and so the men would come out and of course, all the rest of us would laugh at them. And they said, well, you go try it. And I said to one of them, if I'm going to go in there, I'm going to be like the ladies. They're smart. They sit down when they've got to do this, their business. And the guy says, oh, I didn't think about that. That's the easy way. <laughs> and so the ladies ruled they had ruled the world you know and so this guy was going out and everybody was laughing at him and he says when you go just make sure you sit down when you have to go so uh, that was a running joke for a while about all the guys that um you can edit this out if you need to but, <laughs> but it was that really did happen it really did wow um as we came out of the hurricane and we all began to relax and we came back up on deck again. Those who were uh, people of faith were very thankful and were sending up, you know, prayers of thanksgiving because it was a harrowing experience. Um, some were rejoicing that, wow, we just made it through that hurricane. This is so awesome. Um, some of us ended up doing that too a little bit later but we got a, a call on the emergency band. The Swiss air flight had just crashed in Halifax in the Bay of Fundy, oh. right outside of Halifax. And we were 50 to 60 miles from Halifax. We were close. We had a working ROV, the Magellan, 
And Tom Detweiler called everybody in and said, folks, here's the situation. Um, this is probably not a recovery operation or I mean, not a rescue operation at this time, but we're closer than a lot of their ROVs. What is the vote about going to help out in any way we can? What does the ship say? What, is the, what do you say? And um, discussion was made that we can go to Halifax and, and go on back if we needed to, you know, down the coast of Canada to get to Boston and New York. For those that were in a hurry, they could do that. And he took the vote and it was unanimous to offer our assistance. Nobody voted against it. Everybody said, if there's anything we can do to help give some type of clarity to this offer. So Tom, on behalf of the expedition team, offered assistance to the government of Canada in Halifax for that disaster. And um, they thanked us and um, said that they had two ROVs on site and, but, you know, told us thank you though. And, but we did make that offer. I was very proud of our team for, for doing that. If we can help, yes, we vote to go help. That was unanimous. Well, also, so, also a Titanic themed uh, analogy there, right? When you're, absolutely. when you're uh, called on to do your duty, it's your responsibility to try and do it. And I'm, I'm alive because, you know, Arthur Rostron did his duty and offered to help. And he pushed his ship above its normal limits to try to get there a few minutes quicker. He okay. certainly did. Mm. That was our 98 expedition story. From it came quite a few of the documentaries. One of the suggestions that I had to the Discovery Channel producer, Maureen Lemire, was I said, Maureen, you keep showing a lot about all these forensics, the ship's steel, this is how it broke up, this is how it sank. And I said, there's a lot of those. Some people just want to see the ship. They just want to see the images. Here's where we are. This is what it looked like. This is what it is now. She said, you think that would be big? And I said, it would be huge. And so they came up with the best of 98 and it was an hour long and it was one of the higher rated shows of 98. And it did just that. It showed a lot of the footage uh, that people don't see and people watched it over and over. I bet. What grew out of um, this journey that you took to get the big piece and how you survived a hurricane, which is an ama amazing story. And then you offered to go help uh, a plane crash up in Newfoundland. And that, uh, just talk a little bit about the cemetery of the unknown people from victims of the Titanic in Halifax. Okay, 98. We returned home about Labor Day weekend. So I had been gone from late July, August, Sept until you know the beginning of September. Uh, I go back into my classroom. I had missed about three weeks of school. It had been approved for something this significant. Had plenty of days built up, so that wasn't a problem about. So I had been away from the world as I knew it for six weeks. Um, Shortly thereafter, that was September of 98, we held our first big Titanic conference in Greenville, South Carolina in 1999. And uh, an evening to remember is what we called it. And we had some of the people from the expedition come in. And we also had an actor from the movie. I had contacted Bernard Fox. Um, you might remember him as Dr. Bombay in Bewitched. Oh, yeah. Colonel Crittenden and Hogan's Heroes, but he was in two Titanic movies. In James Cameron's movie, he played Archibald Gracie. You'll remember him on the back of the ship where he tells Cal how to give the boy a little something for his trouble. And he says, women in machinery don't mix when Rose said she was trying to look at the propellers. And so that was 
Archibald Gracie played by Bernard Fox. And it just so happened all of, a lot of true Titanic fans knew that he was in A Night to Remember, the Walter Lord movie, um, as Frederick Fleet, who had first spotted the iceberg. So we brought him in and he told us not only about playing in the first movie, um, but then playing in the James Cameron movie and all a lot of different trivia that we didn't know. And he had everybody rolling in the aisles. Um, he had just finished filming The Mummy with Brendan Fraser. He was Winston, the pilot. And uh, he was wonderful. He was there for a weekend, a few days with us. And uh, absolutely fantastic guest and, and worth every bit of time and money we had to pay to get him there and, you know, carry him around and, and, and chaperone, not chaperone him, but uh, drive him around and everything like that. He was just a wonderful person. He's gone now, um, but he was definitely a special, special person for us. Uh, a few months after that, in November of 1999, there was an illegal takeover <coughs> of the Titanic company. George Tullock and P.H. Darjale were ousted by a person who had gathered some friends and they came in and they wanted to take over the company for the purpose of acquiring the rights to sell the artifacts in auction. Uh, they fought the courts for years, uh, spent millions in legal fees trying to get the court to reverse their situation and come back and allow them to sell pieces of the Titanic at auctions and raise what they anticipated to be in as much as $300 million off the artifacts. Uh, RMS Titanic, the company's reputation went from very high to very low during this time. Care was not taken with um, responsibilities that had been prioritized before. Exhibits went downhill and got to be where there were, I think one time one person went through and counted 127 errors on the signage of the new exhibits and they didn't care. They wanted people to pay their money, see the artifacts and leave. I turned the group into the Security and Exchange Commission. I wrote a 15 page letter um, with 18 uh, allegations that I had some type of evidence for. And a few months after that, they opened an official investigation. They did find that I had substantiated everything that I had shared with them um, to a point that they felt that, yes, it does need investigating. Long story short, the bad guy found out that I had done that and he sued me in New York uh, for $1 million. And the suit was intended to intimidate me, to shut me up. Uh, and of course, you know, I'm a school teacher, so squeezing a million dollars out of a, a South Carolina school teacher, <laughs> blood out of a turnip is, is even, you got a better chance at that. So uh, I was in court for several years. Um, the court finally found in our favor and they had to pay about $40,000 in attorney's fees. So that did help some, but they did not reverse the takeover and the, the George was never returned to power. George passed away in 2004, George Tullock. That led me to other areas of research. One of the things that had happened with George we had been discussing different things during uh, 2001 and 2002. And they did a project in Halifax when Titanic sank. Um, the company chartered several ships, one which is the Mackay Bennett. And the Mackay Bennett went out to, for the specific purpose of recovering bodies. Um, they recovered many more than they thought they had or that they would, that they had planned for. They began to bury some at sea until they got the order that said, no, bring them all in. We want to try to bring them all in. They recovered some 300 bodies overall. They were able to identify quite a few of them. The ones that they brought in, if they belonged to a first or second class family, the family uh, had the bodies shipped 
to where they could be buried in family cemeteries. So the trains carried those bodies and the ships carried them to England, uh, the UK, if they were affluent and could afford that. Uh, the ones that could not were mostly third class or steerage passengers were buried in three cemeteries in Halifax, Fairview Lawn, Mount Olivet, and the Baron de Hearst Cemetery there. The Baron de Hearst Cemetery is a Jewish cemetery. Uh, Mount Olivet tends to be Catholic, and Fairview Lawn is the general city cemetery. Um, <clears throat> Baron de Hearst felt it was important to try to identify the Jewish uh, victims and went to identify some of those and found 10 that they felt were Jewish. Um, however, the cart carrying the Jewish bodies went to Mount Olivet and the Mount Olivet bodies went to Baron de Hirsch. So the people that are in Baron de Hirsch are Roman Catholic or Church of England. Um, so it is believed that the Jewish people are either in uh, Fairview Lawn or in Mount Olivet. They have 40 unknowns. And the, what they did in 2001 is they went and they looked for the unknown child. They had a child was a male, approximately two years old. Um, DNA technology was just on the surface. And uh, a couple of people up in Halifax felt, let's see if we can identify who this child is. They identified through the historical records that there were four children approximately the same age and they were male, male children, two years old. And uh, I know Panula was one of those, Pasta Paulson, Sidney Rice, um, and a fourth one. And uh, lo and behold, they were able to find some bone fragments. They were able to do DNA testing on it. And after a while, um, Sidney Goodwin was identified as the unknown child. It was very emotional. These people of Halifax, um, especially some of the people that helped recover the body, they put a small little plaque on the, the, the coffin that the child was buried in, and the plaque still existed. So they were able to maintain the plaque and put it back in there where they did. Um, so George and I had talked about that project, and I said to him, I wonder why they don't do all of them. If they can identify one, why don't they try to identify every one of them? And he said something along the line of, well, you need to go do that one day. I didn't think much about it for quite a few years until the DNA technology uh, is advanced as far as it did. So I started thinking. Uh, America is starting to identify a lot of their World War II victims. Um, based on DNA technology, that is 1940s, but they are confirming quite a few of those. The Hunley submarine was lost in the 1860s and they were able to identify those remains based on DNA technology. The article that really hit me was one where they, um, they did a uh, slave area in an 1820s plantation. In this burial site, they estimate to be 1820s, but they found a clay pipe. And it was a clay stem with a bone bowl. And the bowl had been carved to have African-American features. So they believe that pipe to be belonging to a slave in the 1820s. A forensic analysis, uh, analysis, analysis, I can't say the word, a forensic specialist um, decided to try and extract, extract DNA from the clay pipe. And it just so happened the stem had absorbed, <coughs> excuse me, enough saliva to where they were able to get a very strong DNA uh, reading out of this clay pipe. Now we're talking 1820s. They were able to determine that the user of the pipe was female. They were able to identify a couple of, um, inherited um, defects, birth defect type things, um, just different uh, situations. But the other thing that they were able to do is 
traced due to common strands of DNA that that slave had ancestry in the Maori tribe in the Ivory Coast area of Africa. They had common DNA strands. So that is her heritage. And I thought, if they can do that with something from the 1820s, from the 1912s, they should be able to identify if this person is Irish, if this person is Serbian, if this person is Scottish, and that would help eliminate down to the possibilities quite a bit. And we would find family members that might could trace this back. So two or three of us began to talk and we started project name them all. Um, we had a great presentation at the British Titanic society. And what Project Name Them All basically says is we would like to recover a small sample of DNA from the unknowns in Halifax, if they exist. Um, there is a possibility that there may not be any remains because of the acidity of the soil or the water content of the soil. But uh, if we find any fragments to extract a small sample of DNA, um, we would take those samples, we would put them in uh, an American um, database. They are now protected by HIPAA laws. And we would ask for volunteers, uh, family members of Titanic victims, uh, would you like to see if this is your ancestor? Uh, right now we have 243 volunteering to, to offer theirs. One person declined. She said it was because of religious reasons but she said, I have a brother and a sister who would definitely do it. So I would support them doing it, but she didn't want to do it. So that was the only no. She supported our project, but just did not volunteer her DNA. So we have 243 of the 1100 um, unknown victims who have said, take my DNA, I would be glad to do it. Um, so at the BTS presentation, I went in and talked and I gave the, the story and I said, this is what we want to do is we want to identify it. We want to reunite families with their Titanic family member, the person on board. The lady stands up and she said, I came here to hear you. I wanted to see if you were for real or not. And she said, not only do I support your project after hearing you, but I volunteer to give you my DNA. She said, you have told us that you're not asking for any funds, that you're not there for that. But if you need funds, I will offer the money to help you toward funding this project if you need it. I believe in this project that much. Another lady stood up and said something similar and about seven or eight in the room who were Titanic descendants. Um, totally supported our project. Nobody spoke up against it. We had several good questions. Um, we had a detractor, one person who hates our project. She is very much anti our project. And um, she had been spreading a lot of things around that were not exactly true. One thing she shared was that we were going to exhume the bodies. Well, no, we're not going to do that. We're just going to find, extract the sample, leave everything else as is. Um, she accused us of wanting to sell the DNA uh, on like on Ancestry or something like that, that selling, you know, that's how we're gonna make lots of money is we're gonna offer people chances to see if they're related to a Titanic person. And those are very creative, except if they're protected by HIPAA, uh, that ensures that nothing can happen to those DNA sequences unless a family member does it, we cannot do that. So we felt that was a great safeguard to ensure the integrity of the project. Um, the person went to the cemeteries and created a horrible situation for us by telling a lot of things that were not accurate. Uh, a production company in England got involved. Um, they were willing to do a docu-series six to seven, maybe even eight hours of programming of this entire project as we try to identify some of these unknown victims. Um, right now, the project is is not been approved. 
um, the Mount Olivet Cemetery. It seems to be the first to be willing to talk to us. Um, they are at this point considering a no, we're not going to participate recommendation, but it was not definite. That was their, their um, consideration at that moment. And then COVID hit before we could go meet with them and discuss it again. So it's been on a two year hold because of COVID. Um, we will possibly consider re-energizing uh, re the project when it's safe to travel again and when everybody's confident that, that we're behind this, this pandemic. Um, we may end up having to find a new television partner. Um, the old group d decided they wanted to work with different people than the experts that I had chosen to work with and they wanted to take over the, the project um, in that aspect, and I wasn't willing to do that. So where Titanic is, there's lots of greed and lots of um, people wanting to make lots of money off of it. Um, we have taken each of the unknowns and have identified them based um, on the records from Halifax. Uh, when they recovered a body, they had undertakers that would write very discreet details about each one, heights, weights, scars, facial features, color of hair, color of eyes, uh, tattoos on some of them, what they had on them as far as their attire, what they had in their pockets, and things of that nature. And we feel, and what we did is we took those and we limited based on all the victims of Titanic. Uh, victim number 42, for example, has these possibilities. So we only had 10 to 12 people to contact to, to get a DNA sample there. So we had limited our options for each of the unknowns. So we felt very good about our historical research. And it would have been tremendously um, satisfying and such a great accomplishment for me to have been able to call somebody up on the phone and say, I've got some news for you. He's sitting down. We have identified victim number 42 as your great, great grandfather. Um, I can only imagine the joy that that would bring to a family is to realize he who was lost or she who was lost in 1912 has been found now. The project also in, uh, incorporated several other things. Number one was that we would pay for the new headstone markers to put the names on it to go and be added at each of the grave sites with the new names on it. So it would not be at any cost to the people uh, of Halifax. Another thing that we had done is a prominent American sculptor, Alan St. George, who has been to our conference several times he will be presenting in 2022. Um, Alan has volunteered to do an external sculpture for one of the cemeteries that he chooses to participate. And this is a tremendous gift by Alan to offer this. And I just can't begin to, to say, to thank him for that offer. And he would sit with the cemetery people and they would discuss what they wanted and he would do a, um, a sculpture that they would approve. He hoped it would be some type of Titanic related sculpture, like a cherub or, or a, a, something of that carotid or something. Um, but that would be an approval. Another um, fantastic part of our project, Name Them All, was, <clears throat> excuse me, we have several people who are at our conference who are Jewish. And with talking with um, one of them, there is no memorial to any Jews that were on Titanic. There's memorials to the band, to the engineers, to the Marconi people, um, to lots of different groups. So I contacted a memorial service in Halifax, a memorial that makes monuments. And we designed a monument that would be approximately seven feet tall and be approximately 10 feet long um, it would have a large panel that you would look at um, this way. On one side, we would write the victims' names in English. And on the opposite side, we would write them in Hebrew. 
we felt that that was appropriate. And it would be such a wonderful a way to commemorate those people, to remember those people. On the two end caps, we would put, um, you know, that this is a memorial to the Titanic victims. We would put a walkway around it. And in the back, we would put the dedication information. But we would also have a small um, bin of stones. Um, I am not Jewish, but I know that it's a Jewish tradition that to take a stone and to put it on a headstone or a memorial in some way is a way to honor one that has been lost. Um, if you watch the movie Schindler's List at the end, the victims and the movie people put a stone on Oscar Schindler's grave. And that's what piqued my interest as to what did that symbolize? And I found out, so we would have a ledge so that someone could take a stone and place the stone on the ledge there at the memorial to honor or to to memorialize, pay some tribute to those victims. And that would be at no cost to the cemetery. Um, the owner of the monument company was Jewish. And when he heard that, he donated all engraving. Now, when you talk about 90 people's names in English and in Hebrew, plus the inscriptions on the end, that is a significant a contribution there. And it, uh, we could put the memorial up in, within three to five days. And uh, those would be if those cemeteries choose to participate with us. But right now, the cemeteries are in a quandary. One of their fears is that, well, what happens if John and Mary Smith in 2022 decide they want to exhume his great great grandfather and instead of burying him in Halifax transport him to a cemetery in England and I said well that's not going to happen pretty much because number one there's not a lot of remains to move it is, has been over 100 years I said but the cost to do that would be fifteen to twenty thousand dollars American that sort of cost prohibitive. Um, it would seem more realistic to fly over to Halifax and recognize your great great grandfather's grave that way. And each of the people that I've talked to would definitely leave their, you know, their ancestor where they are now. They would not want to exhume and remove. A second fear is they think that some of the people may not like it. They may think it's ghoulish and they don't want to suffer the negative repercussions of that. So Project Name Them All has great intentions. We would hope that uh, they listen to the family members, the people whose ancestor may be in that grave that want that test. Um, if they do that, then the project will proceed and we'll do you know a few at a time. But that's Project Name Them All. That was such a great idea it's such a great project. The only uh, real couple of people that don't like it are the the one that I told you about earlier, one of the detractors. And uh, she has created quite a stir and a lot of slandering, but, you know, I'm moving beyond that. So where is the project as it stands today? As it stands today, we're still on hold. Um, our forensic anthropologist has said, you just let me know when we're starting and I'm going to give me a little bit of lead time so I can get the time. Uh, that person is currently serving as a forensics expert. And um, if there's an accident or something, she's called to the scene to, to, to figure out what occurred, things of that nature. Uh, we have another uh, DNA specialist who is a professor in Denmark, and he said he would most happily uh, be a part of it. And so um, the rest of the team is all they need to hear is let's go, let's do it. And one of the special things about it to begin with was I contract, uh, contacted Maureen Lemire, who was on the discovery ship in the 98 expedition. And I said, Maureen, here's a project. Do you think that there would be any um, documentary teams that would want to be a part of this project. 
And so she um, found us a place right away, uh, uh, a company that wanted to join in with us. They definitely had said this might be a good thing. Um, the conflict was, is they sort of wanted to make it into a, um, oh, the show where they do the forensics on someone they find, um, those type things. They wanted to do those um, NCIS type show. Right. And I said, I don't want to be so much of an NCIS as I would a historical documentary because this is history using science, not science talking about history. So that was what the conflict was. And uh, we'll have to straighten that out um, and or find another production partner. But it was a great project. I'm interested in the project. We've come to the point in the show, uh, people who have seen some of the other shows know that I do little Easter eggs inside my model. And I wanted to show you what I've been building while you've been chatting. So this is, you, you got the very valuable position of talking while the bow was being built. So I am now going to write on these beams that are going in permanently, Bill Willard. That's me. I'm the king of the world, I'm on the bow. You are, that's right. <laughs> Okay. How much fun it still would be playing with Legos. Well, I can tell you, and anybody watching, it's a lot of fun. And um, I had never done a Lego before. And so I'm not going to say this might be your first Lego project because, you know, it's not all that easy. But there you go. Those are your two beams. They're right in the bow. That is awesome. Thank you for thinking of me like that. Well, sure. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, Shelly. Thank you, Bill. Bye.